Hello and welcome to Big Deal. Today, let's get chatting with British International Investment, which has a net portfolio value of about $2.2 billion in India. And let me welcome on the show Nick Donoho, who is the Chief Executive Officer at British International Investment. Nick, always a pleasure to welcome you on CNBC TV 18 on your India visit. What are the key themes that you are focusing on and how has been your visit so far? Let's begin with that. Yes, well, it's been, I've been in India all week. It's been a great visit so far. Um, BII, as you know, is the UK's development finance institution uh, owned by the UK government. Uh, so our priority is we've got, a, a, um, I suppose, what you described as a dual bottom line. On the one hand, we want to invest in India. Uh, we want to earn returns in India. But at the same time, uh, uh, we want to make sure that we're having a really important influence on, the de on, on overall development in India. And so whenever we look at investments, we look at both these, both a, both a financial and a, and a, and a development, an in, development impact case. I think in India specifically, there are two sort of, I suppose, very broad themes uh, that we're interested in. One is uh, the uh, climate transition. And the, uh, obviously, this country will need an enormous amount of capital uh, to transition and meet its net, met, meet its net zero commitments. Um, and we think we can play an we can we can we can play an important role in that. Um, so part of that is about obviously more re renewable energy generation. But for us, a lot of it is about moving on past the things that are becoming more, I suppose, plain vanilla and doing uh, some of the more uh, perhaps riskier, uh, more innovative areas. So we're looking very closely at things like biofuels. We're looking at uh, at the whole EV space, whether that's manufacturing or whether it's. Uh, 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 building uh, infrastructure. Uh, um, so we're looking at agriculture, we're looking at resi adaptation, resilience within, within agriculture. So that's a big theme for us, uh, um, um, uh, 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 climate and sustainability. And the other big theme is inclusion. I mean, almost whatever um, line, poverty line you draw, India still has more people living below that line than any other country in the world. So there are still enormous challenges in terms of whether that's financial inclusion, whether it's access to health, whether it's access to education. Um, so we're looking at all those uh, where the private sector, because we're a company that invests in the in, in private sector companies, and we're looking at where the private sector can play a real role in, 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 in those issues. You uh, spoke about several themes that you're interested in. And yes, your focus has been development finance based on sustainability as well as impact approach, Nick. Uh, so that's a very differentiated area. You recently invested in Mahindra and Mahindra's uh, EV business. Tell us more about that particular investment and also what is the potential of growth of this investment because of which you've made this investment? Yeah. No, look, I think for us, that's, that's obviously one of our larger investments in India. Uh, and our commitment to Mahindra was $250 million. And really, um, uh, you know, uh, and I talked earlier about the, 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 the challenge of climate transition in this country. And a huge part of that transition will be um, moving to uh, electric, uh, electric vehicles. Mahindra, obviously, are one of the largest of the largest uh, vehicle manufacturers in this, in, in this country. Um, and we wanted to partner with them to do what we could to help accelerate that, uh, uh, their entry into that market and uh, accelerate their transition to, an, uh, to becoming a, a leading EV manufacturer. We're, uh, um, we're very pleased recently to see uh, Tomasek join us in that, uh, in that investment with, uh, with their commitment to, uh, to Mahindra. That's right. And uh, Nick, it's a big investment for you. And when we talk about sustainability, you did mention the energy transition bit. Now, which side of the debate are you on when it comes to the energy transition and the cost that is involved in that transition for many of uh, the old economy companies? And also, on the other hand, who bears the cost of the uh, change and the energy transition? Because it comes with some bit of investment. Yeah, look, I think I think we have to accept that the climate change challenge is really the the greatest challenge for our uh, for our generation and the next generation, and we all have to uh, play our part in the, in 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 that transition. And I think what we see certainly from uh, companies, um, uh, and that includes the sort of older economy com company uh, com companies, is a real willingness 
uh, to adapt their business model and adapt their business processes to become more energy to become more energy efficient to rely more on on um, on on uh, uh, renewable en uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, so I think it's it's not a, it's not a sort of a, a zero sum game. Uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a real incentive I think for for everybody and for every company to play play its part. And we see we see I mean obviously that will need finance. It will obviously also need some support from government. Uh, and we're seeing governments in, in all the countries in which we invest provide uh, 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 levels of support. Uh, but yeah, it's not a zero sum game. I think it's a win win for everybody. That's right, and uh, a long-term solution to many issues in the world, uh, Nick. But And we all are working towards that. What are uh, the key themes globally that are developing, especially in energy transition, the future of clean energy, as well as sustainability parameters right now? Give us a sense of that, because you have an overview of so many developing themes and topics across the world. Yeah, so look, I think the key themes are in renewable energy are how we can move and transition to green, to um, uh, away from fossil fuels into green uh, uh, generation, particularly in power. Um, we obviously have the, uh, solar and wind have become very well established in many countries. In 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 uh, hydro is already very well established. So it's how we move on past those and explore areas like, and they're not equally relevant in every country, but biofuels, for example, is very relevant here in, the, in, in India. The geothermal may be less relevant, but relevant in many of the countries that we are that, that, that we look at. So that theme of, of accelerating the shift towards generation of power through renewable energy is, is, is a key theme. I think the uh, other key themes are, are, are trans, you know, the transmission network. Uh, we will need to, um, renewable energy tends to be much more fragmented in terms of its generation. And we'll need to, uh, in most countries, we need to make huge investments in the, in the transmission networks in order to uh, both uh, take on and distribute the, uh, the energy that we produce. And so I think that's probably been, to some extent, an under, uh, has been an overlooked area. But in many of the countries in, in, which, uh, in which we invest, that's going to be a huge, uh, there's going to be a huge need for capital uh, there. Uh, and then I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole transition through um, in, in mobility. So electric vehicles were playing, as I said earlier, a big part here in, in, in India, both in, in, for example, as you mentioned, by supporting Mahindra. But on the other end of the spectrum, we're support, we have invested in companies to do, for example, battery, battery swapping for two and three wheeler vehicles. So that whole theme of how do you build the uh, enabling infrastructure, the EV infrastructure, to allow that transition uh, to electric vehicles. Um, so those are some of the, I, I think, uh, uh, um, the broad area of adaptation and resilience. So it's not just about uh, um, changing or um, becoming a greener economy, but it's also about uh, ad having adapting to what will be an inevitable rise in temperature of one and a half degrees, possibly possibly more. That has big implications in, in, in India. We saw, for example, uh, in, in Pakistan, the, the damage that the, the, uh, the floods caused. So um, adaptation and resilience, how that's going to be paid for, what is the role of government, how much of it is, is, is or, or effectively needs to be done through the public sector and our public goods versus how much can be done through, pri through the private sector. Um, we're investing actively uh, in, 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 in climate tech broadly um, to, to help to uh, try to develop new solutions to help companies and, uh, and, and households better adapt to, as I said, what will be an inevitable change in, in, in climate. So I think those are some of the, some of the key themes in our markets. Right. Uh, so, Nick, you touched upon several very interesting and very important points, and things are evolving on that particular front. How do you see India on two specific points that you mentioned? First of all, the energy evacuation, so the right transmission lines and having the infrastructure. And the second, the battery uh, for uh, the uh, EV space and EV mobility, uh, that needs uh, proper infrastructure, which we are still in the process of building. And it's also a costly affair and adoption will also depend on how uh, reasonable it is because India is a very price sensitive market. In your view, how is India right now positioned on these parameters and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world, where do we stand right now? 
Yeah, so look, I think on the transmission side, like every other, like almost every other country in the world, there is significant investment needed. A lot of that will have to obviously come through the public sector, but significant um, investment needed in building, um, uh, not just building new transmission, but also building transmission that can, uh, that's more flexible and can allow for um, more intermittent power, which is uh, um, often uh, the case with uh, uh, many forms of renewable energy. So that's, that is uh, important here. I think on the on the EV infrastructure side, that's an area where we've been, been frankly more directly involved. And I think um, uh, you know today, as far as I understand, something like one to two percent of of three wheelers in this country are electric. Uh, that's obviously a very small percentage. Uh, the so there's enormous potential uh, for that to increase. Um, today, if you're driving a three wheeler. It's, uh, it's, it's still somewhat more expensive to buy an electric vehicle. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, once you own the once you own or lease the vehicle, then the operating costs are small are, are, are smaller. So it's, a, it's an attractive proposition uh, for, for owners, but only if they can uh, access power when, uh, when they need it. And so that's, I mentioned, uh, uh, Battery Sm uh, Smart is a company that we've invested in that does battery swapping in multiple uh, locations. So the drivers bring in their batteries, they swap them out, and they put, in, uh, they put in new ones. That's a much cheaper proposition for drivers than buying a vehicle with, with, a, with a, a battery. So those are the sort of things I think that, um, uh, that uh, those sort of networks, those sort of companies uh, need to grow very rapidly. Uh, to meet the uh, to meet the uh, the growth in in EV vehicles themselves. Right. Are we matching up with the the demand and uh, uh, adoption in terms of adoption? Where are we, Nick? Very quickly. Well, my understanding is it's something like one to two percent in, in terms of adoption of EV. It's, it's I think in three wheelers, it's about one to two percent of the of the of the vehicles in India today are are, are electric. So it's a very small uh, it's a very small percentage. We have a long way to go on that and uh, development finance uh, from uh, firms like yourself are also really giving that support and growth capital for this particular space. Nick, hold on to your thoughts. There's much more we want to discuss with you right here on Big Deal. So after a very short break, stay tuned. Welcome back. We are in conversation with British International Investment. Nick, we were discussing the entire sustainability impact as well as the climate change aspect. But you also have a fair bit of investment when it comes to the Indian financial services space, both listed as well as unlisted. What is the thesis behind that? And many of the mid and small cap universe is something that you have been showing interest in. What is your thesis behind these investments and what have been been the kind of return parameters so far have been up to your uh, expected standards? Yeah, so we have invested, if you look back over the last, I suppose, seven or eight years, we have invested extensively in the, uh, in the financial sector. And we, we use the financial sector, obviously, as a way to intermediate our capital. We lend money to banks so that they can all lend to try and address some of the developmental issues we, we, we talk about, we, we've talked about it. In fact, we very rarely, uh, probably only one case, I think, where in the last uh, seven or eight years where we've invested in a public company. That's not normally what we would do. Now, some of the companies that we invest in, and particularly some of the financials that we've invested in, have become public during our period of ownership. Uh, so you obviously then, uh, you end up owning a public company, and over time, um, you know, our objective then would be, would be to di uh, divest in, in the company. And, um, and, and overall, uh, the, the returns have been uh, very good over that period of time. We are also, uh, as a development finance institution, very concerned about what we call the additionality of our capital. So by and large, we want to be investing, uh, providing funding where funding is perhaps difficult to or uh, difficult or sometimes impossible to obtain. That's why, Frank, for example, we really don't uh, or very rarely invest in, in, in public markets. We try to focus on those uh, financial institutions that are catering for um, uh, less included uh, markets and groups. So 
Uh, we've done quite a bit of microfinance to try to reach down uh, to uh, poorer communities, and we continue to we we continue uh, to do that through companies uh, like uh, like microfinance, for example. Uh, we have a strong interest in trying to help um, ex extend credit to smaller and micro en micro uh, enterprises. Uh, and that's obviously a very vibrant area in, in India at the moment. A lot of fintech opportunities in the fintech sector. A lot of them are focused on these sort of small, very uh, much smaller companies. So those are. So when we think about our finance, our our, um, uh, our investments in in financial services today, those are sort of the areas: um, uh, microfinance and small and micro enterprise lending, and uh, and trying to, uh, if we possibly can, to find those companies that are building new so that new solutions and new ways of looking at credit and new ways of providing credit to reach those those sectors. Right. Do you think that these spaces, uh, Nick, are uh, not invested enough into and they do require growth capital, especially from a development finance uh, firm like yours? Why does India need the development finance? Yeah, look, I think that's a very good question. I mean, it is, uh, and it's one that our shareholder, who the UK government is obviously very, very focused on. And as I said, we call that, uh, we call that additionality. Additionality is not um, uh, just measured financially. I mean, you can be additional as an investing institution, both, both by the money, you, the capital you provide, but you can also be, uh, be additional by how you work with the company once you are a shareholder or a lender. So we've done a lot of work with many of uh, with, with companies on on uh, areas like um, uh, well, some sort of climate, gender, trying to make them more more efficient, trying to increase the number of, of, of women in employment. So those sort of things also make you a, a additional. And um, and as I said, we don't. Uh, when we talk about investing in financial, there's a whole banking sector here that maybe, you know, five, ten years ago, perhaps needed more, needed capital from organizations like us. Now it's much less necessary. So we've really moved away from those larger banks, certainly listed banks, and the financial services companies that we uh, fund today will be smaller, certainly more risky, certainly trying to reach, certainly often using more innovative methods right. to use uh, to reach us uh, um, poorer communities. So it's not the case necessarily that they're going to be, they're going to have uh, easy or certainly not unlimited access to capital. But it is about, it is a, it is a, it is, it is a, it, um, uh, it's a, you know, there, there, it's, it's often not black or white. Um, yes. There's sort of a new, you have to uh, sit, evaluate very carefully whether or not these companies need your capital and whether or not you'll really make a difference as a, as a shareholder or a lender. Right, Nick. So you have a very di differentiated investment strategy compared to many of those private uh, equity firms. And uh, you did mention certain pockets of financial services also, which are left uninvested and therefore you're providing them the growth capital. I want to understand, uh, currently India is one of uh, the attractive investment destinations for the rest of the world. Has it changed your strategy for India? Are you more euphoric? How much are you looking to invest in the next uh, near term of, let's say, one, one and a half years? And at what pace has it increased over the years? Has it changed? Has the mindset changed towards India in the recent past? Yeah. No, I think, look, I've been coming to India for 25 years, and I've seen, and always was sort of within the financial sector, and seen the most extraordinary transformation in this country, well, across the board, but particularly in, in, in capital markets. Um, and even in, uh, I've had this, uh, I've had my current job at BII for seven years, and even over this seven-year period, when I compare uh, when I first came to India in the job seven years ago to now, in terms of the evolution of the domestic capital markets, has changed enormously. The attractiveness of India as an investment destination for internet large uh, institutional international investors has uh, changed dramatically. So now you've got all the world's large, large and I travel in you know the, the, the in the in the Gulf and so on. Meet lots of the of the large in, in Singapore. Meet lots of the large. Uh, um, uh, sovereign wealth funds, everybody's looking to increase over time their allocation to India. Um, and it's so, like, you know, you've also got all the, many of the largest, the world's largest uh, pension funds invested here. So there is a lot of 
a lot of capital. And as again, as a development finance institution, our approach has to evolve. We have to try to, uh, we're, we're not here to compete with traditional, you know, even sovereign wealth funds or private equity funds. We're, we're here to seek out those opportunities that are that are sort of incremental, that are additive, and that contribute to, to, de to development. I don't think the amount of money that we have been investing in this country really hasn't has been reasonably stable over the last, um, call it, uh, you know, five, six, uh, seven years, and at around sort of anywhere between 300 and 500 million dollars uh, a year. We have stated publicly that we expect in our current strategy period, which runs from 2022 to 26, so five years, to invest a billion dollars just in climate finance. Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, uh, and, and then on top of that, we'll be doing the other investments in uh, um, what we've described broadly as inclusion. Some of them will be financial uh, institutions that cater to that uh, market. Some of them will be in areas, and I saw this week actually, uh, some co a couple of, of great companies that we're investing in or potentially investing in in health, for example, right. in agriculture. Um, so altogether, I think yeah, you'd expect uh, us to continue at that pace that we've had for the last uh, um, uh, few years. All right. So very, very positive commentary coming in from you, Nick, about India investments and how you see India as an investment destination. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time and insights on your India investments. Thanks, Nick, for joining us right here on CNBC TV 18. All right. Lots of takeaways coming in from a development finance uh, investor and also somebody with a focus on sustainability as well as the impact approach on the investments. With that, it's a wrap on Big Deal. Thanks so much for tuning in.